It is late June, 1862. The sweltering sun is baking the men of both the Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac, both locked in bitter combat. Fitz John Porter's V Corps has suffered a significant defeat when the whole of the Army of Northern Virginia drove itself into their defensive lines along Turkey Hill. The battle, which would later be named Gaines's Mill, would solidify George B. McClellan's decision to withdraw from his forward positions and relocate his base of operations along the James River. This operation would require abandoning countless supply depots that the Army had so readily relied upon for their operations. The largest of these was a rural station along the Richmond and York River Railroad called Savage's Station. The station had been established as a major supply hub due to its relative safety, its close proximity to the front lines, less than two miles from the front lines nearby Fair Oak Station, and its location along the main railway line recently captured by the Army of the Potomac. This station would play a key role in furnishing the Army of the Potomac with food, ammunition, weaponry, and all other supplies necessary for the army to function. It would soon become the scene of fierce fighting, and one of the unsung tragedies of the war. Today, we'll be looking into the photographs taken at Savage's Station to better understand the era, to understand the tragedy that unfolded at this place, and the eventual fate of this iconic location of the war. At least three photographs were taken at Savage's Station in the days prior to the battle. It is likely that all three photographs were taken by James F. Gibson, a photographer who ended up under the employ of Matthew Brady during the war. Before he captured these photographs, he had taken several others in Yorktown and this particular photograph of Captain and future General George Armstrong Custer with Lieutenant James Burrell Washington, Custer's friend and recent prisoner of war after being captured at the Battle of Seven Pines. The series of photographs that will be shown were all taken using a stereographic camera, a type of camera with two lenses placed at roughly eye-width apart. These photographs, when viewed through a stereoscope, were meant to give off the illusion of a 3D image. This was common among most of the photography from the period due to the profitability of selling these copies of the original negatives for wider consumption. The first of the images we will be looking at is this image of a small consist of flat cars with soldiers sitting on top of them. The photograph was taken facing towards the southwest, on the northern embankment of the railway line. The individual soldiers appear to be in various conditions. Some are wearing slings, which support an injured limb. Others are lying down flat on their backs, while many are sitting upright with their feet dangling off the sides of the flat cars. Most of these men are casualties of various degrees. Some of these men are simply sick, suffering from some form of disease, from the flu all the way to dysentery. Many of these men are wounded, suffering from some form of injury during the recent fighting not too far off to the west. These men were likely being taken to Savage's Station from nearby Fair Oak Station for treatment or had just been loaded onto the flat cars in order to be shipped further eastward towards White House Landing along the Pamunkey River as a part of the general evacuation of the station and its personnel. These men are sitting on top of four flat cars. These cars, unlike their modern counterparts, were significantly shorter. Upon the capture of the Richmond and York River Railroad, 
much of the equipment still online was repurposed for military usage, with additional equipment shipped over from northern railroads. This collection of rolling stock was given the designation of United States Military Railroad, or USMRR for short. You can see this designation painted on the side of these flat cars in the forward-most car. Around these flat cars, we see a detail of soldiers standing guard, several more sitting along the bluff nearby the railroad bed, and at least one person who appears to be a civilian, likely a member of Gibson's photography team, if not Gibson himself. In the background, off to the far right of the photograph, we see at least one tent. This tent appears to be what was commonly known as a Sibley tent. The tent was designed by Henry Hopkins Sibley in the 1850s as a large tent that could house more men than the traditional A-frame tent, large enough that a fire could be lit inside of the tent to keep the roughly 12 men housed inside the tent warm during cold winters. Sibley ended up joining the Confederate States of America during the war. However, his tent design would go on to be mass-produced by the federal government and would be utilized throughout the war, especially at Savage's Station. It is here that we move away from the location of this photograph and move towards the main photograph of the station and the encampment built around it. In this photograph, we catch a glimpse of the size of the logistical operation going on at the station. This photograph, which was taken facing due north, shows off the nearby roadway, where wagons are situated, with the railway embankment not too far off from that. In the background, we can see a large building with numerous outbuildings nearby, all surrounded by numerous standard A-frame, walled A-frame, and Sibley tents. We'll first look at the foreground details, namely the wagons, the beasts of burden being used to pull them. The road they are on is one of two dirt roads that fed into Williamsburg Road from Savage's Station. Dirt roads, like this one, were commonplace throughout central Virginia during the war. These roads could be both a blessing and a curse. When the weather was dry, they would serve their function well enough. However, when the weather turned, these roads would turn into mud bogs, often making it difficult to navigate. You can see here some of the deep furrows dug into the road by the wagon traffic, along with mud on the wagon wheels, indicating that it had rained relatively recently. Between May and June 1862, a large number of storms had blown through the area, some of which proved to be lethal that saturated the roadways and washed away several bridges. Traffic on these roadways would consist of a mix of marching columns of men and, most importantly, wagons filled with supplies. These wagons would act as the final transfer point between the station and the men on the front line, carrying food, ammunition, equipment, and other supplies necessary for the army to function. In this shot, we see at least three canopy-covered wagons lined up to begin hauling supplies. The beasts of burden used to haul these supplies were the common mule. The mule, which is an infertile crossbreed between a donkey and a horse, were bred in the hundreds of thousands, serving as one of the most important linchpins in the logistical operations of both armies. What's notable is these mules all have bobtails. A bobtail refers to a horse or mule that has had its tail docked or cut down in order to minimize the risk of their tail getting caught up in the links and chains used to attach a mule or horse to the equipment they are hauling. The foremost wagon has a team of six mules prepped and ready to haul whatever goods are meant to be moved. Such a team could haul thousands of pounds of supplies to their destination, which would be necessary given the poor road conditions in late spring of 1862. 
From here, we begin moving towards the background, where we see the railroad bid rising up from the nearby low ground. On the line, at least two boxcars are present, which have the same designation of United States Military Railroad painted on their side, along with the car numbers painted in big, bold letters. What's notable in this image, and in the previous image, are the coupling mechanisms used for these cars. During the war, the standard type of coupler used for railroad lines was the Lincoln Pin Coupler. These couplers functioned by having two open slots with iron pins running through them. In order to link them, a large iron link would be slotted into the openings and locked into place with the iron pins, coupling the two cars together. These couplers proved to be risky to work with and hand injuries were commonplace. These couplers would eventually be phased out in favor of a safer design, the knuckler coupler otherwise known as the Chaney Coupler, named after former Confederate officer and railroad engineer Eli H. Janney. What's more interesting is that there's also a man standing inside the boxcar, mostly shrouded in darkness, a detail you wouldn't know if you looked at the image from afar. Beyond the railway line, we can see more mules and horses. One soldier standing with his rifle on his shoulder while a group of men are milling about around a large quantity of crates and barrels, likely crates of hardtack and other provisions used to feed the Army of the Potomac. It is here we see a limitation in the photography of the era. One of the figures appears to be nothing more than an apparition, almost like a standing shadow. What occurred here is that the man who was standing there had moved out of line of sight. In fact, it is likely that this man, to the left, was also the figure over there, but we cannot know for certain. Moving further up the hill and back towards the right, we now get a chance to look at the different permanent structures lining the hillside. The largest structure out of all of these is this building. The building is known simply as Savage's House which is named after the Savage family. The surrounding buildings consisted of barns and quarters for the property's enslaved population. This building is likely the wagon house, while this building to the far left is the log barn, a building used to store timber to keep it dry. The building immediately behind the house is likely one of the quarters for the slaves which tended to the property and its adjacent farmland, a wheat field towards the northwest, and a peach orchard to the northeast of the house. When the Federal troops commandeered the station as a supply base, the surrounding structures would have been claimed as well. Many of these structures, such as a large barn, were used as field hospitals to tend to the sick and wounded men of the army. Even then, these structures weren't sufficient in housing the large quantities of sick and wounded men, prompting the need to erect a large number of tents all throughout the property. These tents would become a necessity as June 27, 1862 brought about a wave of wounded men from Fitz John Porter's V Corps after their defeat at Gaines Mill. By June 28th, the hospital would have over 2,000 wounded federal troops packing the whole property. This leads us to our final image. This image is tagged as having been taken on June 27, 1862, the day of the Battle of Gaines's Mill. This was the field hospital at Savage's Station, there are dozens of men lying on the ground, languishing in pain and misery, as they awaited for a surgeon to examine them. Some have the luxury of laying on a tarp to keep them off the ground. Others aren't quite as fortunate. In the foreground, we can see one of the surgeons examining the leg of a young man. Many of the surgeons of the Sira weren't required to get a medical degree. Most were regular doctors 
who'd mainly dealt with house calls of various degrees. None were experienced with the sheer quantity of sick and wounded men that flowed through the field hospitals. They were overwhelmed with the sheer number of men needing medical assistance. In order to get through these numbers of men, the surgeons of both armies would have to make rapid decisions on what to do in order to treat as many men as possible. Further in the background, we can see several more men assisting the wounded as they are examined. One curious face in all of this is that of a young black man, wearing civilian clothing. This young man was either a slave of the savage household or one of the local freedmen from the nearby area who volunteered his services in aiding the wounded men in the field hospital. Civilians, men and women, enslaved and free, black and white, would volunteer their services to aid the wounded that piled up in these field hospitals by providing them whatever comforts they could. This entire site was all taking place within the confines of a small animal pen. The little shack in the background is likely a pigsty, a structure built for hogs and sows to sleep in to protect them and their piglets from predation. This area was only one section of the field hospital. The wall seen off to the right is the main structure that housed the field hospital, a barn converted into a ward for hundreds of men needing medical attention. These men, who are now stuck outside in a pig pen, were placed here because the barn had already been packed with hundreds of men who were wounded and sick. These men lying on the ground were a small portion of the 2,000 wounded and sick men being treated at Savage's Station. In the background, we see a tent row, where more of the wounded would have been housed as they began their road to recovery or awaited their transport back to Washington, D.C. Off to the right, we see a wooden structure. This is likely one of the slave quarters on the property. The final detail I would like to focus on is this ladder, which appears on the left side of the frame and is leaning against the eaves of the barn. This ladder seems like an odd anomaly, however, there is a purpose for it being located there. During the war, finding advantageous high ground to observe enemy movements was sought after. If no large hills were available, a common place to find this would be local structures that could act as a vantage point to observe such troop movements. Usually, church steeples or structures of that nature would be used. If those structures weren't available, the Army of the Potomac would make observation platforms on top of existing structures. One such example was the Berkeley Plantation House, which had several platforms built on top of the roof of the structure for observation and use by the Army's Signal Corps. It's likely something similar had been done to the barn due to its location on the far extremity of the property and its vantage point looking over Williamsburg Road and the adjacent farmland. However, all of the hard work placed into Savage's Station to make it into a functioning field hospital and supply depot would come undone on this exact day, June 27, 1862. Towards the northwest, Fitz John Porter's Fifth Corps would be decisively defeated at Gaines's Mill and would be forced to retreat across the Chickahominy. McClellan's supply base at White House Landing was at great risk of being cut off, forcing McClellan to rapidly withdraw to a new base of operation towards the south. Harrison's Landing, nearby the abandoned Berkeley Plantation. This would require the immediate evacuation of all of their supply hubs along the Richmond and York River Railroad, including Savage's Station. As supplies were being burned from Fair Oak Station towards Orchard Station, the thousands of wounded and sick men at Savage's Station needed to leave. 
for those who could walk, they took their chances and left. However, for most of them, they had little to no chance of leaving. On June 29th, General John Magruder would launch a second offensive against the Army of the Potomac as they retreated. They'd meet here at Savage's Station and fight against the disorganized rear guard action of the Army of the Potomac until they were forced into a stalemate. However, those rear guard elements would soon retreat, and the thousands of men still left behind would end up as prisoners of war, being shipped back to Richmond to undergo medical treatment. Many of these men would be exchanged and paroled, but many more would die from their wounds and be buried in Richmond's cemeteries. Unfortunately, the site of Savage's Station is long gone, swallowed up by the intersection of two major interstate highways and urban development. Only the Richmond and York River Railroad, now under the management of Norfolk Southern, remains as a testament to what was once there. The wounded and sick men who died shortly after their capture would eventually be exhumed and brought to Richmond National Cemetery and Seven Pines National Cemetery, where they may finally rest in peace. These photographs offer an important insight to a time and a place that are now long gone. They are a window into the past, singular frames that tell a story long forgotten. It is important we study them and see what they have to offer, to witness with our own eyes the story they tell. 